In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul deals with the topic of the resurrection of Jesus. Not just the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection in general. And in verse 12, there's a, a, a problem that he states. And he's going to be addressing that problem throughout the rest of the chapter. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Interesting question. If you've embraced Christianity and Christianity states that Jesus is raised from the dead and you don't believe that, what kind of benefit is Christianity to you ultimately? But this idea among these Greeks is not really a new idea. You encounter it when Paul is on those missionary journeys. When in the city of Athens, what Luke records in Acts chapter 17, he's talking to a group of Greek philosophers. Within Athens, he sees the base of a foundation for a statue with no statue upon it that says to an unknown god. Incidentally, such a foundation has actually been unearthed by archaeologists. Whether or not that's the one that Paul saw, who knows, but it actually validates the point. They don't want to leave any god or goddess out. And just in case they've missed one, they have this, this base with this inscription upon it. And Paul starts by saying, the god that you're worshiping in ignorance, let me actually describe that god to you. And he talks about the futility of trying to create an image of God out of um, an image of an individual or an animal or a combination of those. And he says, in beginning in, in verse, verse number 30, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Not a new idea. So not too many miles west of Athens, the city of Corinth, you have individuals who have embraced Christianity, but they still have this kind of skepticism. If you look at the foundation upon which Paul is going to build his arguments. Go back to the very beginning of 1 Corinthians 15. And this is what he writes. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, but which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which you also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, Paul says if you describe what the gospel of Christ actually is, the basis of that is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he says that's according to the scriptures. Those elements of the life and death of the Messiah were prophesied in the Old Testament. If those religious elite in Israel had been, uh, been noticing without looking at Jesus through a lens that wanted a military leader to drive out the Romans, they might have seen that. Paul didn't see it either for a long time. So the statement in verse 12 is, that here's the problem. You know, we are proclaiming a message that says Jesus rose from the dead, and if that is something that we're proclaiming and you're not believing it, there's a problem. And he deals with arguments to actually validate what he is saying of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and he intensifies his arguments as he continues through this chapter. To begin with, verse 13, 14, and 15, he talks about the relationship of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus in connection with the message, the gospel, that's being proclaimed. And this is what he writes. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. Our preaching is worthless if this is not something that's valid. At the beginning of verse 16, he goes from the topic of the message that's being proclaimed to the faith that they possess, verses 16 through 19. If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. 
if the resurrection of Jesus did not take place, we're proclaiming something that's not true, and you're believing something in vain. And he goes back in verse 20 and reemphasizes the fact that there are witnesses to this. And Paul says, I am one of those witnesses. Verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the, fir has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In verse 29 and following, there is even another argument that he uses, but verse 29 is one of the most contested verses in the entirety of Scripture. And almost as many different ideas have been, um, been advocated of the meaning of this verse, almost as commentaries on the book of 1 Corinthians. Here's verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Does that mean that if somebody dies and they're an unbeliever, that generations later somebody can be baptized for them and their sins are forgiven after they're dead and gone? Is that what this verse actually says? There's a large religious group that practices that. That's one of their cardinal beliefs. They have lists of genealogies like you can't even imagine. Is that what Paul is saying? If I go back and plug that into to statements that I find Jesus making, does that really fit? For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, down in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, unless, years after you die, somebody that's a relative or somebody that knows your name actually baptized for you, then everything's okay. Is that what Jesus suggests? anywhere, not just in the Sermon on the Mount, but in his teaching. Or in Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus illustrates the, the day of judgment where you have those that are blessed on his, on his right hand and those who are not on his left, and what he says to each of them. To those on the left, he says in verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil as angels. For I was hungry, and you did you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me sick. And in prison, you did not visit me. So I'm telling you to depart unless somebody generations after you died actually is baptized for you, and then everything's forgiven, everything's okay. Is that what Jesus says? Or at the very end of Matthew, and what's been classified as that Great Commission, in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have commanded you. But if they don't, if they don't anything, if they don't observe anything, that's okay, because maybe generations later, somebody that knows them that's a distant relative will be baptized for them, and everything will be forgiven, it'll be okay. Is that what Jesus is teaching? Or that short verse in John. If you love me, keep my commandments. But if you don't, that's okay because maybe somebody's going to be baptized for you generations later and that take care of everything. Do you see the problem? You see that it does not fit what Scripture says any place else? In fact, Paul writing to the same group of people, to the Christians in Corinth, this time in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 10, For we, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Paul did not add a parenthetical statement, unless you have somebody that knows you generations from now or has researched your name and is baptized for you, and then everything's forgiven, everything's okay. It doesn't fit. Back to the verse in question. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? There is nothing in Scripture that would allow the idea that you can be baptized for somebody that has passed along from this life who was an unbeliever, and your baptism for them today takes care of their sins and puts them in right standing with God. There's nothing in Scripture that would indicate that anywhere. So does this verse say that? I think in some ways, people and theologians included get so caught up in looking at one particular verse. Again, context is everything. I want you to notice some similarities between some phrasing. In verse 29, the second question, 
If the dead, actually really it's the first question, if the dead do not rise at all. Otherwise, then what, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Is there a similar question in this passage? These building upon and actually intensifying it in verse 29, the answer is yes. Verse 16, if the dead do not rise, sounds very similar to if the dead do not rise at all. Well, what's he saying in verse 16? If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If the dead do not rise, Christ is dead. And what's he saying in verse 29? If the dead do not rise at all, are you baptized for the dead? What dead? Are you baptized for a dead Messiah? What will we do who are baptized for a dead Messiah if the dead, including that Messiah, do not rise at all? Why then are we baptized for the dead? Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we are being baptized for one who is still dead. If I put it in his context, is it that difficult of a verse to figure out? But there have been volumes written about this verse. Because looking at the context, the, the construct of the wording in this verse, without necessarily putting it back in the context of what Paul actually says. If Christ is not risen, who's the person that's dead? It's Jesus. You're being baptized for a dead Messiah. What kind of sense does that make? Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? And Jesus is dead if he's not risen from the grave. It's tragic whenever individuals take one particular verse that cannot fit anywhere else in Scripture according to the context of every other passage that you can, you can read and research, even within this same chapter, and come up with something so perverse as the idea that if you die as an unbeliever, somebody can be baptized for you and get you out of torment into the blessings of those who have actually given their lives in obedience to God. That's not what verse 29 says. It elaborates and intensifies what he has stated in verses 16 through 19. And the similarity in those verses is something that's very, very clear. May we always endeavor to make sure we took a look at context in Scripture. Sometimes just doing that can provide um, an answer to things that have been perplexing to the minds of, of thousands for hundreds and hundreds of years. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, the message is empty, our faith is vain, and we are still in our sins. Now you can argue that, well, yeah, but the life of the Christian and those precepts and those principles still pre present uh, the a great, a great kind of, a, of series of ethics that we can follow to get closer to the potential that God has actually built within us. Well, that's true. But as Paul says in this chapter, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, if the only hope we have is here and now, we are of most men, or of all men, most pitiable. Interesting chapter. Take a look at verse 29 in context Verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. There's a phrasing in verse 16 almost identical to what you find in verse 29. Context, context, context. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.